Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Anxiety and Depression Association of America webinar, How to Overcome COVID Reentry Anxiety. The ADAA invites you to explore the many wonderful resources available online at adaa.org. ADAA acknowledges that anxiety is at an all-time high. This webinar will provide tips and tools to manage COVID reentry anxiety. I would now like to introduce our expert panelists. Joining us today, we have ADAA board member, Ken Goodman. Ken is the CEO of Quiet Mind Solutions, and he is an expert in anxiety and OCD. We also have joining us today, Dr. Deborah Kisson, CEO of Light on Anxiety, CBT Treatment Center in Chicago. And we also have Dr. Rose Marin, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and also the founder of the Center of Anxiety in New York. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We will be answering questions at the end of this webinar. For those who are watching on demand, please email your questions to webinars at adaa.org. I would now like to hand this over to our presenters. Again, thank you guys for joining us. I uh, look forward to a wonderful webinar. All right, thank you guys for being here. We have a large live audience. We're happy to know that. Um, you know, last time I did a, uh, a live webinar, my dog who seldom barks started barking right in the beginning. So we'll see what happens uh, this time. I have a lot of material, so I'm gonna go rather quickly. If you miss it, you can always re-watch it. But about 14 months ago, the country was traumatized by uh, COVID-19. There was news stories 24 seven. We saw images of people on ventilators. We saw images of death. There was a shortage of protective equipment for hospital staff, as well as just the general population. And it was predicted that 2.2 million people in the United States would die. It was an unknown virus that could be transferred from one person to another without even anyone having any symptoms. So it was very scary. And when you imagine catastrophic possibilities in any form, your anxiety will increase. And that was certainly true for coronavirus. Anxious behaviors, in addition to anxious thoughts, will also increase anxiety. So the more you watched about COVID-19 on the television, the more anxious you became. The more research you did about it, the more anxious you became. If you never left the house or seldom left the house, if you left deliveries on your porch for several days and then disinfected them, if you took your temperature 10 times a day or wore gloves and a mask when you were outside driving around by yourself, all of these behaviors, anxious behaviors, increase anxiety. And many people are still doing those behaviors today. Now, not only can individuals become very anxious, but a society as a whole can become very anxious when it focuses on the catastrophic. So imagine for a moment, um, the media and government were focused on driving fatalities. And there was 24 hour news footage about driving accidents. And we saw horrific accidents, footages, we saw um, tallies of uh, fatalities going up and there was a daily count and there was uh, discussions about how best to handle these problems. What would be the result? Well, there would be an escalation of driving phobia. The challenge for any problem is to find a balance between being safe and living life. And people who drive have successfully found that balance. So most people do not suffer from via phobia. Why? Because we acknowledge the danger, but we also know that it's safe enough. We, we focus on living our life and not focus on the horrific possibilities. We choose to accept the uncertainty of driving because it is uncertain, there's no guarantees. And we do that in order to live a full life and we don't avoid, we don't avoid driving places and we don't engage in unnecessary safety behaviors like wearing a helmet while you're driving. So this is the blueprint really for reducing your COVID anxiety. Um, we have to acknowledge the danger, but understand that certain activities are safe and we have learned a lot 
in the last 14 months. So the primary route of transmission is the inhalation of small respiratory droplets from an infected person. But what is safe enough? Well, according to the New England Journal of Medicine, a significant exposure of COVID-19 is a face-to-face -face contact within six feet of a person with COVID that is sustained for at least a few minutes, and some say for 10 or even 30 minutes. So the chances of COVID-19 passing from one person to another in a uh, public space outside is minimal. So if you're not wearing a mask, someone else is not wearing a mask, and you pass them, there is minimal possibility of transmission. A systematic review of the literature published in February in the Journal of Infectious Disease found that less than 10% of all COVID-19 cases were transmitted in outdoor settings. So again, outdoor settings are safe enough. Because of this, the CDC says that unvaccinated individuals can take off their masks while walking, running, and biking alone and with small gatherings of fully vaccinated people. So these are activities that are safe enough. What about through surfaces though? How likely is it that you're gonna get COVID through a surface? Well, Emmanuel Goldman, professor of microbiology, biochemistry and molecular genetics says, in my opinion, the chance of transmission through inanimate surfaces is very small. And in only instances where an infected person coughs or sneezes on the surface and someone else touches the surface soon after the cough or sneeze, like within one to two hours. Remember that your skin protects you. The only way to get infected is if the, for the virus to go inside of you. So um, the virus must enter your body. Therefore, it's not touching surfaces. It's touching your face with or without gloves. That's the problem. So without a vaccine, it's safe enough to walk outside without a mask to drive without a mask, to exercise outside without a mask, eat outside. You don't need to disinfect deliveries. Um, you can bring deliveries into your home the same day. You can touch objects without a glove, without gloves. But what if you've been fully vaccinated? What are your chances of becoming seriously ill or dying if you are fully vaccinated? So uh, in April, just last month, 19th, um, there might be more recent statistics, but this is what I have. 84 million Americans were fully vaccinated. 6,000 of those 84 million contracted COVID. So we know now, we now know that you can still get it if you've been fully vaccinated. 30% of those people had no symptoms, 400 were hospitalized and 70 people died. So you can actually die if you are fully vaccinated, but I'm assuming, and I don't know this for sure, that most of those 70 people were elderly and they probably had a pre-existing condition, but I don't know that for sure. So out of 84 million fully vaccinated, 70 people died. That is an incredibly small number. So the CDC recently dropped their mask wearing advice for fully vaccinated people, unless you're in large crowds. So it is safe enough if you are fully vaccinated, but it is not 100% safe. Every day in this country, approximately one fully vaccinated person dies of COVID-19. That's pretty good. Consider this, if you compare that to driving, every day in this country, approximately 100 people die in automobile accidents. So if you don't worry about getting into an automobile accident, logic would dictate that you should not worry about dying from COVID-19 if you have been fully vaccinated. So although logic can relieve some worry, it won't eliminate anxiety. To eliminate anxious thoughts, you must first eliminate your anxious behaviors. Anxious behaviors maintain the anxiety. You can't overcome a fear of lymphoma if you keep checking your neck. You can't overcome a fear of elevators unless you get on the elevator and do it repeatedly. So to free yourself anxiety, you must face your fears. You must tolerate the uncertainty. You must tolerate the distress. And you must take brave and gritty steps towards freedom. The good news is, is that when you do uncertain activities on a frequent basis and you tolerate the uncertainty and the distress, the fear and anxiety goes away and joy emerges. So I want to play this video. This is an interview I did with a former patient prior to the vaccine. This was last fall. He came to me with severe COVID anxiety and uh, we worked together. And so this is the interview. 
anytime a UPS package would come, uh, you know, I would put on gloves and a mask and, and clean it on my front porch and then set it to the side for 10 to 14 days. Would you clean it with disinfectant? What would you clean it with? Uh, disinfectant. Um, and it was same with groceries. I would clean all the groceries on the front porch um, and then bring them inside and then rinse them in, my, in the sink because um, I obviously didn't want to bring the disinfectant into the house. And so it was a huge, long, drawn-out process. Were you avoid going out of the house? The only time I would leave was to go to the grocery store. Um, I would wear a, a mask and gloves, and then I would also bring a disinfectant wipe. So tell me about what your anxiety level is now. You said back then it was like an eight or a nine. And how has it been for the last you know, couple of weeks? Um, I, I, I would say a one or a two. I, you know, and I'm thinking from a much more reasonable part of the brain, I think. <laughs> so you're not, would you say that you're not worrying about it as much then? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Before the uh, therapy, were you, was it just like a constant thought in your head? How, how would you describe it? Yeah, but it would turn into like more than a thought. Um, I mean, it would turn into um, almost a panic. And in terms of your anxious behaviors that you were doing before, um, tell us uh, what changes you've made. Um, and I think this is what's made, you know, probably the biggest difference, you know, with you and I working together, you um, kind of giving me goals each week to remove, you know, one or two anxious behaviors, whether it was to go out and get a haircut or stop wearing gloves in the grocery store, um, you know, stop cleaning my car and removing those, you know, anxious behaviors is what has brought me more peace and more, uh, you know, I'm able to sit back and relax a little bit. I'm not stripping off my clothes and jumping in the shower every time I leave the house. Um, I'm not wiping down UPS packages. Um, I'm going places. I'm, you know, I got my first haircut a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, I'm going to work meetings and so on. It created um, a significant amount of anxiety at the beginning, but, you know, I realized that, you know, on each thing that we kind of chipped away at, that I was feeling better and better. I think the faster that um, you take action and the less you sit at home and deal with this, the better, because um, on the other side, it's much more enjoyable. So it's interesting that the less safety behaviors he did, although as his anxiety rose initially, it, it reduced and he became free from anxiety and started enjoying life. So it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Well, if you live by this motto, it ensures that you stay uh, anxious because the safety behaviors that you do maintain the fear. Um, if you need to be 100% certain, you get to keep your anxiety disorder. So I wanna turn this over to Deborah now, who will uh, talk about, um, I, I believe a case, correct? You have to unmute yourself, unmute yourself. There we go. That's one thing, uh, all these COVID behaviors of talking and being muted and all of these, all of these new behaviors that we've, we've learned and unlearned. Right. So Ken, what great information that you shared and really planting a lot of seeds uh, that I'll kind of weave in when talking about the case that I'm sharing and then David's going to be sharing a case as well. And then for everyone who's come to join us today, our goal is to leave lots of room for questions and discussions and to learn together because we, we really are all moving through this together. So as trite as it sounds, it's true. So wanted to introduce you guys to Ben, uh, Ben, a 43-year-old male who has received both doses of the COVID vaccine and his family has received all the doses of the vaccine by now, which is all wonderful. And we're also thankful for that. He's in good health. Um, he started treatment at the start of the pandemic where he was feeling very out of control, very worried, tons of tension, uh, having a difficult time sleeping, 
challenges with his family where everyone was engaging in different kinds of behaviors to manage to manage COVID. And so, and he also in the past had received treatment for contamination OCD. So trying to kind of figure out the difference between what is a, a compulsion and something that I've done in the past versus what is something that is reasonable to do right now, which was a very tricky question. Okay, so next slide. You know, for some reason it's not advancing now. Oh, maybe I need to advance, maybe I, did I do? This is what happens when you have a live thing. There's always wrong things that go wrong. Maybe uh, I should stop sharing and then you could share. Um, oh wait, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay, good. And I, I hear a noise. I'm just gonna close my door so nobody walks in while we're doing this live. Okay. And my dog has not barked, so we're, okay. we're lots of good things are happening. Okay. So um, Ben's COVID living, he really developed a, a rhythm of how to get through the year. Okay, this is how I get through my groceries, and this is how I wash my hands when I come out, and and we'll have weekly family Zoom get togethers and, and started to find comfort in all of different controls and his world got smaller and smaller as all of our worlds did. And it, it became um, not only bearable, but starting to like, wow, it's nice to not have to go to those events, those happy hours that I didn't want to have to go to anyway. And it's kind of nice to order, um, order groceries and, and not go out. So I think certain behaviors he realized he really didn't like anyway, but certain kinds of avoidance crept in that were a little bit less healthy. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so um, from COVID safety behaviors to compulsions. So it really is a gray area and something I've worked with my clients to determine when is it just something that's healthy living and something in this phase of life that makes sense to do? And when is it a compulsion? I normally think about, it's more of a compulsion when it, you have this urgency. If I don't do it right now, something really, really bad, there's not that flexibility. Like I'm going to, I'm going to wash my hands because it makes sense. It's, I need to do it right now, or I will feel unbearable discomfort. So that urgency is normally one of the signs. It's more of an avoid an anxiety behavior. So he started engaging in um, checking the limits of his control. So checking to see if his family members were washing his their hands the way he believed was appropriate. Reassurance seeking if he was going to engage, go maybe out of his bubble. Do you think it's okay if I go into the office for a few hours? So checking with other people versus trusting his wine mind, wise mind. Um, searching, uh, lots of searching for like the COVID maps and trends and oh, in his neighborhood now there's a spike in this zip code. And so all these ways to try to have control and st still double masking when going out even after vaccinated. And that's an interesting phenomenon or I'm seeing a lot of people were, or maybe a lot of the spouses of people thinking, okay, once they get the vaccine, they're going to calm down a little bit because now they're closer to the realm of what actually is safety. But that's when you know you're in, you're locked down by anxiety when no matter what you do, it's never enough. So it's kind of an insatiable uh, enemy in some ways that no matter what you give it, the next time it wants double. So I think for a lot of people after they got the vaccine, maybe imagining, okay, now I'll be able to feel a little bit better, but it's like, well, it's still not certain. How do I know for sure that's okay? And so for a lot of people, even after the vaccine, that anxiety isn't going away because it's not certain as Ken so beautifully showed as driving is uncertain, as nothing we do in life is certain, but we choose the areas we're willing to look, look aside from the fact that life isn't, life is risky. Um, continuing to work from home, even though his office was open. So I talked about this a little bit in terms of when you know it's becoming more of a compulsion versus just healthy living, you feel compelled. It doesn't feel like a choice. 
you, it's something you have to do. You're not choosing to do. If you delay the behavior, it causes a lot of extreme anxiety. Um, it doesn't feel like there's any flexibility. You have to perform it this many seconds with this much soap. You, you could tell when you're engaging in a flexible approach versus very rigidly. Um, and the consequence of not engaging in the behavior is if I don't do it now, I'm just gonna feel more and more anxious versus I'm gonna be in very real danger. Um, okay, moving on to the next slide. So um, the re-entry anxiety showed up with just lots of worry thoughts, kind of stuck in a worry loop of how do I know it's the right thing to do? And how do I know for sure, even if I have the vaccine, that I can't give it to somebody else? How do I, um, if it feels too, is it too soon to engage in certain things? And oh no, what if, because I have the vaccine, it's gonna make me just be too risky. So in a lot of ways, he actually became more anxious and his generalized anxiety became even more activated post-vaccine because it allowed his world to open up, but yet the uncertainty was still there. Next slide. So um, we kind of tackled a little bit, like what is that fear really below, what if I do the wrong thing? What if I push it too far and I get someone else sick? So it was really this fear of responsibility for harm uh, and kind of a scrupulosity. If I did, if I did the wrong thing, because I was just selfish and I wanted to do something fun, but then I got someone sick, that would be unbearable. And how would other, others judge me if they found out that I somehow spread COVID? So we call this a downward hour technique where we kind of look at the fear and try to get at what is that core fear. So for him, oh no, what if I get COVID and then I get someone else sick and then they die and it's my fault and everyone thinks I'm irresponsible. And so the core fear, fear is really living the rest of his life feeling guilty and tormented that he's a terrible person. So all of the control behaviors engaged in were this trying to prevent having to live with this anxiety and guilt. But as I mentioned, no matter what you do, it's never enough. So if you try to play by anxiety's rules, it's always gonna be one step ahead of you. Okay, next slide. So we worked on um, different, as Ken said, exposure exercises of, instead of giving to the anxiety bully when it says, okay, well, you need to do this. And then you do it to make it calm down a little bit. But then moments later, it tells you have to do double, doing the opposite. So whatever his anxiety bully was telling him to do, starting to really challenge it. Like, you know what? I'm not gonna let you call the shot. So starting by wearing one mask versus two, which was progress. And so no judgment, it's about taking that next step forward. And for each person, that next step is gonna be different and that's fine. Um, allowing his children to have friends over. So less control over others in his life and really allowing for healthier dynamics with his family. Starting to return from work, uh, returning to work and, and broadening his world. Um, and other forms of response prevention, meaning not giving into some of those compulsions he got used to doing of sanitizing the groceries and checking with his family members to make sure they wash their hands appropriately. We also did some imaginal exposures of um, tolerating that somehow he got someone else sick, even though he was vaccinated. And then everyone at the school found out that he was out somewhere and got someone else sick and then everyone was saying, oh, did you hear Ben has COVID and was a super spreader and wow, he's so irresponsible and just sitting with what that feels like. Cause the goal for this work is training the brain to kind of face that scary scenario head on and, and tolerate that anxiety versus trying to run from it. Cause if, it, if in reality that had to happen he would just have to cope with it. Cause that's what we do when hard things happen. Okay. I think that's my last slide. Handing it over to David. All right, thank you, Deborah and Ken. Deborah, really cool to see uh, how you helped that person. And Ken, thanks for the great perspective and uh, really a reality check. 
in so many ways. You know, what you said about the vehicle, uh, vehicle accidents versus uh, COVID is really, really is very, um, very clear. Um, so the case I wanted to present is a female, a single white female named Melissa, who graduated college in last year. Now, I just want to say at the outset, I, I think a lot of people who were going through transition periods in the last uh, year, um, transition periods of life, that is, were particularly affected by anxiety and depression. By the way, how's my audio? Because I'm hearing a little bit of echo. Is it okay? Not great? A little bit of feedback. Tiny crackly, but not terrible. Well, hold the phone. Let me try that. Is that better? I think so. Keep talking. La 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 la. Yeah, that's yeah. better. And and you sound great too. About my tone, and I yeah. sound great. Well, now we're talking. So I switched to mine. It's going to be mic. singing later. No, um, but um, I'm too socially anxious for that. Um, kidding. But let me tell you about Melissa. So, all right. Now, what I was saying, in fact, was this: that a lot of people are going through transition periods. So, people who started high school, people who graduated from high school, started college, graduated college, like Melissa. Um, started a new job, had a baby, got married, um, got divorced, whatever it was, people who had those transition periods, like in the middle life transition periods at the beginning of COVID or in the first couple months of it, I think I've definitely seen in private practice that this uh, th those folks have done, um, have struggled the most. And Melissa was in that category, interestingly. So currently she's not yet received a vaccine because she's concerned about getting a blood clot and she's also has this long-standing fear of needles, which is extremely inconvenient, considering that you need to get a needle in order to get the vaccine. Um, she also, um, but during COVID though, that was not her primary concern because the vaccines weren't available. Now it's an issue. But during last year, she found herself staying home a lot, um, really uh, hermiting, uh, so to speak. Um, and that made her feel uh, very anxious, but also very depressed. And she'd never been depressed before. This is a uh, you know a very high functioning, uh, in some ways uh, Gregor you know, Gr Gregorious lady. She's very sweet and she's great. Um, and uh, but really got hopelessly depressed for the first time, feeling sad, feeling down in the dumps, not enjoying life, pushing off her coursework. She actually almost failed a couple of courses, um, and which almost pushed off her graduation, which would have been a disaster. She did manage to pivot. Her college was very um, helpful and supportive, which is fabulous and a lot of colleges have done that, some have not. Um, so she was fortunate to have that and also family support, but she definitely withdrew from social activities, even virtual social activities. She was really very sad. Um, the, the, the worst part though, was that she stopped enjoying even eating ice cream. And that's when she knew that something was really bad. And she actually, and that was the one thing that led her to call up my office for, for help. I was like, if I'm not enjoying Haagen-Dazs then something is wrong. Anyhow, um, she had not had previous treatment for anxiety and uh, um, she was coming in. So she's stuck. She's stuck now in this period of residual depression because those symptoms are not completely abated, but also this anxiety um, because she has to get a vaccine. She wants to get a vaccine, but she's terrified of the needles and she's terrified of the, of the potential blood clots. So her depression was really fueled by the pandemic and feeling defeated, feeling that she couldn't overcome it. And her anxiety um, now is kind of keeping that. Um, just in terms of her COVID depression, you know, there's a, there's a concept that inactivity fuels depression. When people get depressed, they're less likely to, in, likely to engage in behavior. And then when they don't engage in that behavior, that actually fuels the depression further. And then when they feel more depressed, take a guess that they're more or less likely to engage. Substantially less, which fuels the depression and around and around we go. And that's exactly what happened to her. She felt defeated by COVID, she felt sad, she stopped engaging in activity, she stopped attending classes, going out socially, which increased her stress. Then she didn't wanna go out for social, class, social activities at all. She stopped enjoying even ice cream because like I'm such a failure, that's what she told me. Not, in, not, in, not enjoying anything, feeling worse about herself, less likely to engage in things, increased stress, and you can just see getting stuck in that, in that repetitive cycle. And now, she, you know, she's had depression now for the first time. She's got a small anxiety, it's fairly localized. I mean, it's a specific phobia of needles, 
And then the concern about the, 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 the blood clots is very localized aspect of anxiety. She's not generalized, no, no GAD here. But if, in the combination of that with the depression, it's actually a substantial problem because she, now she's stuck. She can't get out of it. I want to make one point also clear about anxiety versus fear. And this comes up a lot. Ken, you kind of went around the edge of this, but I just want to really make it very clear. Anxiety, sorry, fear. Fear is a healthy response. When people come to me and they say, I want to become less fearful, I say, you're at the wrong address. I don't want you to become less fearful. If you're afraid of actually getting hurt and there's a real risk of that, I'm not going to change that. I want that to be in, to in, 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 in intact. If there's a real risk of something, if you have a certain medical condition and that's you know right now and that's going to make it that the vaccine doesn't work, well, then that might be fear. And that's not anxiety. Anxiety is an excessive response based in your mind, not based in reality. Fear is something real. So for Melissa's treatment, um, I, we targeted her depression first because the fear piece is going to be very, the, the anxiety piece for her, because it was excessive, is going to be very hard to treat when she's on the couch. And what I taught her was a, a concept of behavioral activation, which is an evidence-based treatment for depression. Um, and the core of it is action precedes motivation. When people act, then they feel good. Usually you think I feel motivated and then I act. That's not how it works. Usually you start doing something and then you get motivated. So we had her engage in a whole bunch of activities. In fact, first we just had her monitor her activities. What are you doing throughout the day and how does your mood fluctuate with that? And she found, wow, when I get out of bed earlier, I actually feel a little bit better. When I go outside and I go for a walk, my mood picks up for the next hour. If I shower, if I brush my teeth, if I call up a friend, if I do the things on my list, even if I'm not feeling it at the time, I ain't feeling the love right then and there, but later I get a lift. And we gave, did these behavioral experiments where she would um, engage in something and then see, is it gonna make me feel better? Is it gonna make me feel worse? At one point we just had her sit in bed and she's like, I feel terrible. I'm like, Great, well then get out of bed. So that was an experiment. Um, and then once we had data, we did activity scheduling. So we scheduled out in her activity, in her, in her schedule, in her, in her Google calendar, pleasure activities. So eating haagen -Dazs. Even if you don't like the ice cream, eat it anyway. Um, mastery activities, paying your bills, making sure you're applying for jobs in her case, um, making sure you're um, doing, what, doing what you need to do. Social activities, so going out, even if you feel terrible, getting up, putting on makeup, I mean, to the extent that she could, obviously, you know, in, in her case, it's much more virtual and more limited in her social network. And finally, and most importantly, value-driven activity, which is something that often gets um, short shrift, but, but the behavioral activation research shows that if people are doing something that they really value inside, that's huge. We also worked on her sleep. So going to bed at a certain time, waking up at a certain time, no napping during the day, and this got her moving. It, her depression started to subside. And now I'll tell you about her anxiety. For that, there was a lot of psychoeducation about the fear versus anxiety piece that I told you before. And then exposure therapy, as you might've guessed. So looking at pictures of needles, watching on videos, people getting shots of needles, watching um, people um, actually going and bringing needles into the, you know, it, it, actually having her, most of it was virtual, get needles and looking at them, looking at the syringe, you know, taking a look at it, maybe like poking it tight a little bit into her finger. Um, and then eventually helping her to go and schedule a vaccine and, uh, and, and, and going and get it, getting it done. And about the vaccine safety concerns, lots of education about that. It is possible, but extremely unlikely. And the risks that she was taking to get a vaccine were gonna be less than many of the other risks that she took the other day. So that's the kind of thing that we were doing. Um, great. Do I have another slide? Ken, you're muted. Yeah, so there was this slide and uh, one before. I think I might be uh, done with Melissa. Yeah, and then this this was just sort of different COVID re-entry challenges that we're all seeing um, uh, as, as we all have gotten used to COVID living over the last year, different ways COVID reentry anxiety can show up. So getting used to wearing the mask and especially for those with social anxiety, 
that form of not being seen has really been reinforced. And so for, for a lot of individuals struggling with social anxiety, that would have been the dream is to be able to wear a mask to hide. And so for it to be the healthy thing to do to wear a mask, to start going out eventually when appropriate without a mask, it's gonna take some work to move past that. And everyone can do that work and that's the good news. Um, to um, body scan in terms of a dangerous symptom or side effect. Oh, that was kind of related to vaccines, anticipatory anxiety around how we'll feel after the second vaccine. So I, these are just different things I'm seeing in my practice where maybe there's a lot of buzz about the second vaccine and oh no, how am I gonna feel? Am I, am I gonna be able to take care of my kids that day? And so just going into it, lots of anxiety. Um, you want to go, you guys want to take questions from people? Yeah. We still yeah, have. Yeah. I think the I think the main point here is that, you know, in addition to Ben and Melissa, there are lots of different ways that anxiety and depression can manifest themselves today. Um, now what I'm seeing with the COVID reentry anxiety a lot is people don't even want to think about returning to work. A right. lot of offices, for example, they're doing surveys like, hey, what do you think about a, a hybrid option with this? And people are like, I don't even want to think about it. I'm not going to a meeting. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm just gonna wait until I, you know, and that postponement as opposed to facing it is another way that people can get can get into uh, anxiety and depression. And I'm seeing that a lot with, I don't wanna return to work. Oh, it still makes me uncomfortable. And if I really challenge someone, it's like, well, do you not wanna go back to work? Cause maybe you've enjoyed working from home and maybe it's even more effective versus really how anxious are you about returning into the work returning to the office. And like, you don't need to convince your brain that it's still nervous about that. You could just own the fact that that's a bummer. I'm really enjoying working from home. So you don't have to cloak yourself behind anxiety to justify. Maybe you actually are just liking it better. You could just separating out from, I'm nervous about doing that versus like, I actually just don't want to is really important. So I received, we received some questions prior to mm -hmm. The, uh, this webinar, and then I believe that people are asking questions currently. So this is one of the questions we had prior. Um, I've been pretty much staying at home for the last year, carefully following all the guidelines restrictions. I'm fully vaccinated, and I've read that measures are no longer necessary, but I'm very anxious about changing my habits. I'm afraid that dropping the restrictions will make me feel more anxious. I'm, I feel I'm stuck in a pandemic limbo. So when you begin to take these small gritty steps and do things that make you anxious, you will become anxious. When you do things that are uncertain, you will become anxious initially. So for instance, if you are never, if you don't take your mask off when walking around your neighborhood and you then that next step would be taking your mask off and walking around your neighborhood, your anxiety will go up initially. But you will find very quickly that if you continue to do that on a daily basis, your anxiety will go down. So you have to initially tolerate that anxiety at, just at first. And you can take small steps. You can literally walk to your mailbox and walk back. And then maybe you know, a couple hours later, walk you know, a block and then come back. So know that you will feel anxious at first, but then the anxiety will come down the more you do it. And the good news is it's not dangerous to feel more anxious. So yes, you will feel more anxious at first. And yes, you will live a bigger, more engaged, meaningful life. And so it's really important. Anxiety is uncomfortable, but not dangerous. You can handle. So a, a lot of time people get stuck doing all these different things to not experience anxiety, but we do things all the time. We stub our toe, we bump our, we, we're uncomfortable a lot. Anxiety is just one more form of really uncomfortable discomfort, but don't give up your life to not have that discomfort. There's a concept which you see in uh, anxiety treatment, actually it comes from dialectical behavior therapy, which is called opposite action. And the idea of opposite action is that if you feel a certain way and you want to feel the opposite of how you feel, act in the way that's opposite to what 
you're doing right now. So somebody asked a question about how do I want to stop wiping down my groceries. So the opposite, wiping down your groceries, I mean, Ken presented the data before. It seems like a, it would seem like a very uh, extremely uh, conservative approach to, to this. I mean, there's, the, the risk is extraordinarily low. So an opposite action would be taking, you know, an orange and mwah, giving a big kiss. Don't not, you know, not wiping it down, go like this and mwah, all over your face and, that, and tolerating the possibility that like, ah, maybe, maybe. And, you know, if we act in a way that shows that we're not concerned about things, your anxiety will spike initially, like Deborah and Ken said, but that's, that's ultimately the, the the only way to overcome it. Yeah, yeah like the it. video that I showed, the irony is the more my former patient did all these risky behaviors, the less anxious he was when he was pre fully protecting himself by doing all these avoidance and safety behaviors, he was more anxious. I have another question here. Um, I've been vaccinated. I'm staying, I'm doing more activities like um, going out, with friends and going to stores, but I'm very uneasy about doing more. How do I know when it's safe to do more, like going on an airplane flight or going to a sporting event? Will it ever be safe? Well, the irony is tonight I'm actually going on an airplane. Um, and you know, I feel it's safe enough. You know, it's safe enough to get there, land without crashing, and it's safe enough to that I will be okay and not get COVID. Why? Because I've been fully vaccinated. And like I said, in the statistics, if you are fully vaccinated, the chances of getting COVID are extremely low. So it is safe enough to do that. And everyone has to kind of come up with their own equation for safe enough. So someone might decide for themselves, it's safe enough for me to go skydiving. And I don't know the risks of that because what I get, it's an exchange. What I get in exchange is this experience that is so important to me. And someone else might say, it's safe enough for me to eat these unhealthy foods, even if it's not great, maybe for my cholesterol, because I just really love treating myself. So, so we, we're every moment of our life, we're deciding what risks do we want to take and what value, what value do we get out of it? And it's a moment by moment personal decision. So for whoever asked that question, like when is it gonna be safe enough? You really kind of have to just think about, like Ken's example, when is it safe enough to get in the car? Well, if it's worth it for you to go see your friend or see your loved one, then it's safe enough for you to take that risk. And sometimes you have to, in the beginning, it does not feel safe enough. But after you've done these behaviors repeatedly, it starts to feel safe enough. I guess I'll just add one other thing. You know, for the vast majority of human history, there was a lot less certainty about anything. I mean, the, the lifespan, if you, human lifespan has like doubled in the last century or so because of modern medicine. And I think we're so used, especially with these, we have these electronic appendages, right? which give us everything on demand right away, you know, with 100% accuracy, I mean, high, high degrees of accuracy, 99% degree of accuracy. We have, we live in a society that's so, everything's so quick and so available to us that we don't realize that, that that's not human living. Human living is you're gonna be uncertain sometimes. And COVID was a great reminder that like, there are gonna be uncertainties in life. So if somebody's trying to feel 100% certain about everything in life, you're, you're on the wrong planet. That's that's not that's not what this is about. Um, so there are going to be some risks, and I think what Ken and Deborah are both saying is that we have to learn to take some of those risks, and there's a cost benefit to it. And uh, but having 100% certainty is just not going to be. Now there's a question here. What advice do you have for teachers about re-entering school in a hybrid mode? You know, children um, are not spreaders of this, they are low risk as well. And so you have to sort of trust the data that children tend not to spread this. 
And but again, particularly in particularly in schools, the epidemiological data is pretty strong about that. That schools are low risk for for having for spreading for some for whatever reasons. Uh, probably because kids aren't speaking for 30 minutes at a time. They don't have the attention spans for even 10 minutes. They're just, they're darting around each other. So. But it's going to feel very out of control because if you've gone from not being in this environment at all to all of a sudden you're in the environment, these people that are out of your control move about in, in their weight. So it's going to feel very out of control. So it's all the stuff that we're talking to that if, if, of kind of sometimes we just have to jump into the pool and if we just kind of stick our toe in like it's freezing and then we stick our toe and it's freezing but then when we immerse ourselves we habituate we get used to the experience and it it becomes not only uh bearable but sometimes even quite pleasurable so you kind of have to just if it's something you're going to do then just like jump in and start living it and and the anxiety will pass how do you guys answer this question? We got this. Uh, how do you deal with people that are not adhering to the restrictions, like in stores and grocery facilities? I want to know more about the question. Are you angry at them or are you nervous about them? Because if you've been vaccinated, then there's not a whole lot to be nervous about unless you're also the kind of person who's hermits in your room and takes no risk at all, which probably is not the case. If you're angry at them, that's probably a different discussion, not necessarily anxiety or depression. Um, there are some aspects of DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, involving interpersonal effectiveness of how to deal with difficult people, um, which might be helpful. Um, it's probably a little bit beyond our discussion today. I don't think people should be yelling at people for not wearing masks. I don't think people who are not wearing masks should yell at people for, for them wearing masks. Right. And I think for not, some people, not effective. Yeah, it feels like, like, why are we shouldering the burden? Like, I've done all this work and you're out and about doing your thing. And so I, it sounds a little bit like that kind of question, feeling frustrated, like you're, I'm adhering to the rules, you're not. And I think this is one of these distress tolerances, like all the time in life, you're going to find, maybe you're waiting in line and someone's cutting the line, me. And it's about how you're choosing to live your life and believing in your decisions and tolerating others might not. I'll, I'll give you a personal anecdote here too. I was a little frustrated at first when people were sending their kids to school over this last year. And like, I, I home, I actually homeschooled my kids this last year um, out of caution for whatever specific reasons I, I had for it. Um, and I was a little frustrated, like what, you know, there are great things you can do at home. There's great options. And then like last week, and I, I was kind of frustrated. And then I found out this last week um, that, um, or two weeks ago, that uh, the data is pretty clear that, you know, at, at schools are actually fairly low risk. So sometimes, you know, that righteous indignation that we have, it's not necessarily founded in reality. And we can find out later that, you know, other folks actually were, were right, or at least had a perspective that was valid all along. And, you know, there was value for people sending their kids to school and right. taking those risks because then we could study the data. We can study, say that, oh, that was okay. And so... Plus, I can't imagine having homeschooled my three kids this year. Like, I... So... So we all oh, here's a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. Are you done? Okay, so here's a question. There's been a, there's been a lot of talk about COVID never really going away and all these other viruses that are still out there. So I've been feeling like I will never be over this. Like uh, this is just what living will be like forever. It's a bit apocalyptic. Um, any thoughts about that? And I think it's true. Like the flu virus will always be with us and I imagine, and once again, this whole presentation is that we're anxiety specialists, we're not epidemiologists or viral disease specialists. So that's my disclaimer, but chances are that in some way it, it's not gonna be eradicated, but we're gonna live with it and, and we're gonna adapt the way we humans do. Um, but sometimes people feel that I'm gonna be living forever feeling terrified. And I think that's at the heart of the question is I'm gonna be live, living forever feeling not safe that this thing is just lurking over waiting to get me. And so then I'd say doing the work of learning how to face and move through your COVID anxiety and then realizing it's just one of the many things that are out there that you you can tolerate and, and get through. And it doesn't have to feel like, uh, what was the word? Uh, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Nightmare, yeah. What do you guys think? 
I'll give you another perspective here, which is that we've actually been vulnerable to viruses, outbreaks like this for, for decades. You know, this is, this is not something that, I mean, it happened, I guess, out of the blue in some ways, but there, there are report, reports at the State Report Department in Washington that have been warning about this for a long time. There's also other issues, by the way, if the virus doesn't get you, there's rising sea levels, you know, there could be radiation from an astronomical event. There's concerns about, you know, nuclear terrorism all the time um, with increased uh, warheads being now? available. Well, I'm, I'm just saying if you're going to be apocalyptic, then it's probably not going to be a virus that's going to get you. It's probably going to be a nuke. But in, in any event, you know, we can have these, you know, I, I think the point is that for most of history, like I said before, there's been incredible uncertainty. For the most of the last century, I mean, how many wars, you know, were, were fought and people were deployed and they didn't know whether they were coming back and they were high, extremely high levels of risk. If you compare what we've got now to what we had for all of history, I, I'll take 2021, even 2020, I will take it any day, any day. Yeah, I'm very grateful to be living now. And what I said in the very beginning of my presentation is that the more you focus on these catastrophic possibilities, the more anxious you're going to become. But these are just your, is this your imagination creating scenarios? And so if you, if you have a history of anxiety, you could probably go back in your history and think about all the catastrophic possibilities and worries you had. And you can ask yourself, well, how many of them actually did come true? And my guess is probably very few. So let me see here. Uh, tired of running in stores. Um, the time it takes to shop now is terribly long. Delivery sucks. <laughs> Goes yeah. You know, if you if you're if you're going to take the um, go into a store, if you want to reduce your anxiety, do not run and run out. Take your time because running in and running out just escalates anxiety. Let's see what else we have. What advice do you have for parents to give them confidence to allow their children to return to school? Any advice for parents to give the children? I actually like the end of the question, especially when COVID notification letters go out. If COVID notification letters are going out, that means that your school is doing contact tracing. If anything, that's going to give me more confidence, not less. So your school's sounds like your school is on top of it, at least to some degree. And I'm trying to understand for that question if it's if for the parents to feel confident or for the kids to feel confident, to give them confidence to allow. Okay, so for parents to feel safe enough to allow their kids to go to school. I didn't know if it was the kids. Sounds like how can parents feel it's okay to send the kids to school if there is some COVID circulating in their, in their school community? And it, you know, we, we're, we just keep saying the same things, but it's about tolerating like the benefit, like what's the risk of staying home, being socially isolated, missing certain social, emotional, developmental milestones. Everything we do, you 100%. just pick how how do i want to live in line with my values and then we just proceed forward you have to also remember that if your child children are anxious is it possible because you are behaving in an anxious manner um, and so you have to really manage as parents your own anxiety to model for your children in, for some it becomes if you challenge them, like if, if they have the vaccine, well, I could still get COVID. Well, what would be so bad about that? Well, then I could give it to someone else. Well, you're really only spending time with your immediate family and they're vaccinated. Um, well, I just don't want to have it. And it's almost like a contaminant. It feels then just like contamination, OCD. It, there's not really a real consequence, but I just, the thought of having it feels unacceptable. Even if I accept that at this point it wouldn't be dangerous for me, it just feels wrong or bad. Do you guys see that at all with- A hundred percent. And I actually think that, you know, dovetails with one of the other questions about, you know, having a nine-year-old and feeling like, you know, nervous about them getting vaccinated. I mean, them, them who can't get vaccinated, them getting, getting COVID. You know, it's important to entertain in our minds the possibility of things going not the way we appreciate, not the way we want them to rather. And going through that mental exercise, I would call it preparedness, where we're preparing ourselves, not in a worrying way, but just to really just go through the ideas. If you're concerned about sending your nine-year-old to school, they might get COVID. That is a possibility. It's not 
hugely likely based on the data, but it's possible. Now, what are the consequences of that? Have you actually sat and thought about it? Well, we would call that in treatment an imaginal exposure where you're using your mind to face your fears. You wouldn't actually expose your kid to COVID, but you could imagine in your mind what it looks like. Um, and then becoming more accepting of that, you know, that is a risk that you might have to take at some point. What's the intention to keep them home until they're 14 and then they can get a, for the next five years until they can get a vaccine? If it's between one or the other, and those are your choices, then maybe it's not a reason, matter of confidence. And the reason why kids are not being vaccinated is because they are extremely low risk. And then when they do get it, they rarely get symptoms. So there's really no point in vaccinating children um, at this point, because they really don't manifest the symptoms like adults do. But they could be little carriers, little, I can't wait to get my kids vaccinated too. So, but um, Joseph, uh, we have a good question. Um, how to convince an unwilling spouse to get treatment? And unfortunately, we can't convince anyone else to get treatment for mental health or really anything, but what you can do is maybe share with your spouse like, if they're willing to watch this webinar and maybe pass on that the good news is that if, if you work on facing and then moving past anxiety, OCD symptoms, like you will feel so much more peace and relief and have the vitality to live life on your terms. So it, the good news is it really can be so quite effectively treated and worked on. So one doesn't have to live with so much distress. And so there's a lot of, to be hopeful about on that front. When someone is ready to try things differently, there's a lot of good things that can be done. What do you guys think? Totally. Totally. <laughs> totally, completely. Yeah, I agree. Exactly the path. Well, I think we are about out of time. Is there any other questions that you've noted that you want to answer? Someone said about Mother's Day having a Mother's Day with an unvaccinated nephew in your 20s. Firstly, it's pretty cool you want to hang out with your, you know, 20 year old nephew. Um, but um, he's probably got antibodies. <laughs> he's unvaccinated and 20 and going to restaurants and stuff. Um, but even if he doesn't, if you're fully vaccinated, that comes back to what we've been talking about before. There's going to be a risk. We're going to have to all tolerate some level of risk. And uh, that's, that's what it's going to take. Someone asked, can you say a little bit more about those who did get COVID after vaccinated and then were hospitalized and then died? I don't know more. I, um, like I yeah. said, I would imagine that most of those people were elderly or had pre-existing conditions. Also, it's just extremely rare. I mean, people take a chance. You know, I, I'm at work right now. I'm going home later today. I think, like, I hope that, you know, uh, you know, a tree's not going to fall on my car as I'm walking to it. Like, it's possible, you know, this might be my last webinar, you know, Ken and Deborah, it's been fun. Um, I'm going on but, a plane. Uh, and I you're may on not plane. get COVID, but it could crash. And, and whoever asked that question, when Ken presented that study, I had this urge to Google that study. I was like, oh, wait, I thought I heard that nobody died or was hospitalized who had the vaccine. I want to know, let me make sure that they were elderly and comfortable. And I had this urge to know for sure. And I was like, okay, compulsion. Like my brain wanted to know for sure that like, okay, that's not me. I'm okay. And I try and I resisted number one, because on this webinar and that would have been distracting. But number <laughs> two, I, at least sometimes we give in to our compulsions. Sometimes we don't, but it's really good to at least notice. Okay. What part of me wants to know? Like, why do I want to know who were the people who died, who had the vaccine so I could feel better? So, but then I'm just gonna have a false sense of certainty. And in reality, like, so I get whoever asked that question because I was just thinking the same thing, but no matter what, it's a very low risk. Yeah, Deborah brings up a really good point. Remember I said in the very beginning, the more anxious behaviors you do, the more anxiety. So the more research you do, the more anxiety. I wouldn't research it, I would just let it go and count on the fact that it's incredibly unlikely. Right. And I know we're out of time, but we could keep talking about this forever because you guys are asking such great questions and it's always fun chatting with 
And if you need a therapist, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America uh, has a uh, page where you can look up providers in your area, just put in your zip code and it can bring up providers in your state. Mm -hmm. and that is a great resource because the people on who are associated with this organization do have a specialty in treating anxiety disorders and depression. Yes, and it doesn't have to be a big, big, big long-term therapy. You could come in and get some tips over a few sessions. If there's something you're feeling stuck about, you don't have to figure it out on your own. Okay, so well, thank, thank you guys for being here. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. And thank you, uh, you guys be more. safe and focus on living your life. Yeah, yes, ditto. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye. Thank you.